In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to talk about water and withies, camp routines, compass bubbles, fire saw with bamboo, and are ant larvae edible? Welcome, welcome to episode 63 of Ask Paul Kirtley. Um, it's pretty cold where I am here recording this. Um, you might be able to see in the background, everything's covered in a, in a coating of, of frost. And I'm down in this nice little uh, valley, little uh, stream valley, little river valley. I've, I've recorded a few Ask Paul Kirtleys here before. There's a nice fallen tree for me to sit on. So it's a good break on my hike, but it's cold down here today. So I will keep it as brief as I possibly can do because I want to keep things uh, moving and uh, let's have a look right washing with these this is from Max Fjellstom Bushcraft hey Paul hope you're well since I enjoy your Ask Paul Curly episodes I'd like to participate with two different questions one if you were traveling in an area where it says that the water from the lakes and streams etc is mostly so clean it can be drunken directly from it would you still filter boil sterilize it or what kind of water protocol would you take place on your journeys especially if you're out with several people second is there a special technique or not apart from a clove hitch that takes place when setting up a tripod from three canoe paddles with a withy thank you for considering my questions kind regards from germany max mit freundlichen Grossen Max, excellent, good. Um, so, um, I think you always have to go back to first principles on some of these questions, Max, and it depends on what the, what's the worst case scenario? What is it that might be in the water that you might not remove if you treat it as, as safe? That's a question that you need to ask. Um, now it could be the case, um, it's possible, I, I know the type of trips that you do, it could be that you're talking about Sweden and mostly the water is there, it is clean to drink there. But if you were presented with a muddy bog um, that were, with stagnant water that smelled bad, you probably would have the sense not to drink that, whereas a nice clear stream or river or lake, if you know generally the water's clean, they're probably referring to the, that stuff, um, the, the, the former, where it's just full of mud and decaying uh, materials, leaves and, you know, that type of stuff. That's not going to do your stomach any good. Um, so it's really, what's the worst case scenario? Ask some locals as well. It's like, what is what is it that people are worried about here it might be in some areas there is some pollution from farming uh, there could be um, various animal uh, pollutants you know animals feces and that type of thing I don't know I'm trying to generalize you've got a specific thing in mind in general but I would go back to first principles what is the worst case scenario what can happen what would what would be the worst case scenario if you did drink something that should have been boiled and then the other first principle is really if you don't know it's safe to drink you should treat it as unsafe to drink that's really the primary rule with water um, particularly in areas that you don't know and the locals might be drinking the water with impunity but you might still get an upset stomach because you're not used to the bacteria that are in the water for example so you always need to be a little bit careful just from that perspective of getting some local information they might be fine it might make you ill anyway and if you don't know for sure that it's clean really going back to first principles should tell you you need to treat it as suspect you need to boil it or, or what have you um, but equally a lot of people 
will go way too far um you know they'll they'll filter they'll put things they'll put clear water through a mill bank bag and then they'll boil it and then they'll put chemicals in it and it's like no that's overkill yeah that's like you don't need to do that because time and effort and energy is important on a trip um, and you also need to drink enough and all of those processes take a while an efficient process it shouldn't take too long you should be able to get plenty of water um and you know even on for example on our expedition canoeing skills course we have uh, 10 students plus myself and ray goodwin uh, and sometimes an assistant on that course and we put all of our water through a millbank bag or a brown bag and boil it in 10 litre uh, kirtley kettles um, and that's all the water that we use for everything for drinking for cooking for washing for the whole week we produce that way and as long as you've got an efficient system it's perfectly possible to, possible to produce plenty of water. Um, and as long as everyone knows what the system is, of course. So th those are my thoughts on that. Uh, second question was about withies. And um, I'm not a huge fan of making tripods for fires out of my canoe paddles. <laughs> I know you see it a lot in Paul Kane's sketches and you see Ray Mears doing it on Northern Wilderness and various people posting photos on Instagram and what have you but my paddles were quite expensive sticks um, they've got nice finishes on them varnish I want to keep them in good condition for paddling I don't like putting them near fires, particularly not when I've got other people with me who maybe are not quite as familiar with fires as I am. Um, and then of course you've got issues around, well what if a wind gets up? I mean, um, the French River video that I put up a little while ago, it was mainly about paddling down the five mile rapid section of the French River. Um, we had a rock camp. A nice rock dome we were camped up on top of it at the end of the day it's right at the end of that little video um, and when we set that camp up there was a little bit of a breeze not much um, there were thunder clouds in the distance and at some point after dark as you often get before a storm comes in the wind got up very quickly and it was blowing flame out sideways from the fire and um, you know lightweight pieces of equipment like even kneeling mats were starting to move around and um, we had to we had to tie a few things down put rocks on top of them or just put them into the tent vestibule um, in the end the storm didn't come in but that wind came up for about 30 minutes that was really blowing like a blast furnace through the bottom of the fire it would have been scorching uh, paddles if they'd been in a wrong place set up as a tripod so i don't like doing that personally um, i would rather just use some sticks um, if you were using it to hang a millbank bag for example um, for, for a water system yeah sure that would work fine just make sure and again one thing I don't like happening with my paddles on some of those situations where you need a tripod you're often on hard rock that's why you're using a tripod and not some of the pot hanger or some of the suspension method you need something that's freestanding that will sit on top of a hard surface what I don't want are my paddles falling over onto rock because what can then happen is that this the handle part that you're holding in your hand gets a dent in it or a chip that then is somewhere that is going to maybe cause you a blister when you're paddling or a sore point or a hot or a hot spot on your hand and it can be really difficult to get rid of so again i don't want the chance of it being kicked over of it being falling falling over when it's being loaded with whatever it's being loaded with or being assembled or um, it being blown over with with the wind so i don't tend to like to use my paddles but i know why you're asking this question because paddles tend to be quite smooth on the shaft and therefore binding them together into a tripod can be quite tricky because they tend to slip at the binding particularly when you weight them and i suspect that's why you're asking me the question and withies in general if you don't know what a withy is it's something like a piece of hazel or a piece of uh, a willow a long straight wand that you can twist up 
and the fibers start moving around against each other but you've still got the structural integrity the strength lengthways and so you've got a flexible strong binding material that can be used and it's great for bindings it's great for building natural shelters it's great for binding bundles of firewood up you could people have made log rafts binding um, them together with withies um, fences all sorts of things uh, parts of basket making lots and lots of uses for withies and one is binding a tripod together and of course if you're clever about it you can withy up the top of something that's got a side branch on it and that's your hook that you can hang a kettle or a pot over the fire and then all you need to do is attach it around the three legs of the tripod above and then you can hang down and you can bring the legs in or out and you can raise it or lower it over the fire and we do that with sticks in it all, all the time I don't do it with my paddles for the reasons I've already talked about and again the other thing is if you've got a 10 litre kettle hanging on a chain or a piece of cord or a withy and that's been supported by three paddles the end of your paddles is on that rock and it's been moved around it's been moved in and out it's going to damage the end you know those lovely wooden paddles that you avoid bashing onto rocks while you're in the river if you can you don't want to be scraping and moving that around on the rocks um so again i don't like doing that you know a, a decent paddle from somebody like jude at down creek paddle is going to cost you you know over 100 pounds easily 150 pounds for a nice wooden paddle a good quality gray owl paddle is quite expensive you know red wing paddles they're all quite expensive they've got nice finishes on them the wooden paddles you don't want to be scraping them around on rocks so um i wouldn't be doing that um, and in particular a withy tr trying to bind three of them together with a withy is going to be difficult because there's very very little grip between them you're better off using some green sticks um near to a fire anyway rather than dead wood green sticks near to the fire they've got the strength as well they're not going to snap for for a relatively uh, small diameter green hazel willow birch whatever you can find um, and then when you bind that with a withy it bites into the outer bark and the in, and, and compresses the inner bark and, and you get some grip on it and equally if you can get a couple of those sticks to have a fork in them so that they can sit together then you've got a more stable tripod anyway so that's what i would be going for um, to answer your specific question clove hitch is about as good as you can do with a withy i mean a better knot would be a constrictor knot but you're not going to get that done with a with a withy i don't think uh, very easily um, a trick with withies though is once you've got your clove hitch in take the the withy over the top and back down again and that locks it all in um you need a, a longer withy to start off with but that will then lock it all together it will pull the clove hitch tighter it will bind everything together and i think that's probably the answer that you're looking for i would be using green sticks you make a withy clove hitch around and then have a length of withy left and then for that to the whole lot to go over and down again and lock the whole thing together um, and that's the way that we do it and it works it works well hopefully that's useful i said this would be quick and i spent quite a lot of time answering that question camp routine this is from mike taylor mikey good to hear from you mike um hey paul as threatened a question on routines <laughs> i remember this conversation back on the on the woodcraft of course mikey um one of the things that i've uh, i've appreciated as i've increased my time camping is the benefit of daily routines morning and evening what are yours i'm thinking along the following lines morning sleeping bag shake uh, on ridge line uh, when wouldn't you hang it out as you might it might, it might make it worse clothes slept in uh, personal hygiene face arms hair shave crack and sack foot care anything else evening where do you put clothes in a bag where do you put shoes slugs in your shoes in the morning do you put them in a bag um, on a stick uh, tick checks a quick delve into the more moist places um, or uh, mirror and more info than you'd otherwise like personal hygiene any camp checks wood for breakfast fire cheers mikey p.s any idea when the tracking course will be on the website um the tracking course is on the website um the nature uh the tracking and nature awareness course and i believe you've booked on it already so that's probably a redundant part of the question um there's a lot of other questions in there um the short answer is it depends it depends on where i am both in terms of the environment 
um, what I'm doing, what type of activities, and I'll come back to why, um, what the likely issues are in that environment. You talked about ticks, you talked about slugs, you know, you've got to take that into consideration. I don't think there's a blanket answer to all of those things. Um, hygiene is always important, whether you're in cold or hot environments. Um, and then bed gear, sleeping gear, clothing, etc. I'm not going to be able to get through, I mean, there's like 17 separate blog posts there, Mike. Um, but um, in the UK, if I'm working on a course, which I is often a reason that I'm camping in the UK, or I'm just out for a few days on a canoe trip or what have you, what I tend to do, uh, let's start with the evening. Um, I hang, I try and hang socks up under my tarp or inside my tent. And um, so after I take my shoes off, if my, that's when your socks are going to be warmest, when you've just taken your shoes off, if you can just keep them on your feet, open to the air for a little bit to let the heat of your feet and the heat of the sock drive out any moisture. That's a good way just to, just to kickstart the moisture removal process the sweat removal process from socks socks these days i tend to like to wear a thin liner sock and a, and a thicker sock over the over the top um whether that thicker sock is a waterproof sock or whether it's just a, a warmer sock or just a more protective sock um i'll often keep the thin sock on um in bed because that helps really dry it out um it also helps protect the sleeping bag from smelly feet <laughs> <laughs> if if you're not using a sleeping bag liner um but i put a um i put the socks underneath my tarp or inside my tent just as a general thing after that i just sat there letting them evaporate for a little while that's important keeping your feet in good nick is important um if i'm going to wash my feet i'll sometimes do that at the end of a day of hiking i'll more often wash my feet in the morning um when i'm having a wash generally heat a bit of water up on the campfire have a bit of a wash wash feet last dry them off maybe a fresh pair of socks on depending on what day it is um, and if you're wearing a liner sock you can use you can carry more fresh liner socks with you than you can if you're just wearing a single sock so you, you might be able to use the outer sock for a number of days without them getting too nasty but then you can change the inner socks more regularly and because they're thinner you can wash them and then you stand the chance of being able to dry them as well whereas a thick sock if you get that wet and, it, and the, it's not really super warm then you're unlikely to be able to dry it so that, I like that combination. Foot hygiene is important. Some people like to use a bit of foot powder. Uh, medicated foot powder can be good to keep things like athlete's foot at bay. Um, but generally just washing them with a bit of soap and then drying them off before you put the socks on so they go away dry is a really good starting point for continued foot hygiene. Um, keep allowing your boots to dry as much as possible overnight. So you talked about putting them in a bag. I don't tend to put my boots in a bag. I want to try. What I do is I pull the ins. If I'm talking about hiking boots, so if I'm just out and about in the woods or I'm on a hike as opposed to um, a canoeing trip, for example, when I'll have two sets of footwear, one wet set and one dry set. Um, if I've got one set, I want to get the, the insoles out and sitting just in like in the boot like a little chimney that will help the insole dry out much more it will help any condensation that's under the insole get out of the boot um if there's a slug get i've i rarely get slugs in my in my boot um i tend to get slugs more sort of to get into the rucksack and, and places um but i'm not so worried about that clearly if you're in pl tropical places where things can get into your boots that you don't want to be putting your feet into you need routines for dealing with that but if we're just talking about um more benign environments where i think we've met and therefore um you're asking about getting the getting the shoes as dry as possible is is, is generally the uh, an aired as possible overnight and that makes a difference to your foot comfort the next day it makes a difference to whether or not your skin gets soft and you get blisters and all of those sorts of things so getting them your boots as dry as possible on the inside dry feet, dry socks, all of that's important. Um, I tend to wear merino wool uh, boxer shorts, which don't get too smelly. So I tend to wear them 
for a number of days um, and then change them um, and normally change them when I'm having a good proper wash. On a canoe trip you can tend to be able to have a wash quite easily because you can get in you're always near water you can get into the water or you've got access to plenty of water for good wash on a hike it can be harder because um, you might be away further away from water you've got a limited amount that you can carry it's always good to have some antibacterial um, wet wipes because they keep the uh, sort of bacterial flora at bay if you're if you're wiping yourself down in your nether regions with those every day and that helps prevent sores particularly if you're hiking um, and that's important um, you know people can get ur urinary tract infections just from not keeping their private parts clean so that's important you know but again stand up wash with soap and water is as good as anything um, carrying a small collapsible wash bowl with you so you can put some hot water in it. That brings us on to morning routine in terms of fire. Always get your kindling and your fire lighting uh, materials ready the night before. Um, you don't know what it's going to do overnight. It might be pouring with rain in the morning. Um, it's good to be prepared. Get that under a tarp. Get it away where it's dry. Get things up off the ground. Get enough firewood in. Make sure you've got enough water prepared for drinking. Um, if you need to go and collect water from a distance for boiling in the morning you maybe have done that already but just make sure people know it's not boiled already and then whoever's up first lights the fire gets the kettle on uh, try and get some cooking pots in the side of the fire as well if you've got those to heat some water up then if you if you're in a group you've got enough for for, for drinks for cereals granola whatever you're doing you might boil some eggs you know whatever you're doing try and do all of that together using the, the heat of the fire so it's efficient um then there'll be also some hot water for having a wash refer to my previous comments um and that kind of that's kind of it and then you kind of after breakfast brush teeth um good to go i, I like to make sure i use a bit of um, lip salve if i'm out for a while i've got a little robin um wandering around here if you see me distracted it's because of all the bird life um that comes in often you know on the on the trees and the bushes around here it's quite quite dense in with you've got elder and um uh, what have we got we've got this dead sycamore here that's fallen but you've got the um got the hawthorn there as well so it's quite sort of shrubby and and low in in, in this area here and all the the robins and the the tits and the little finches like to come in um so anyway um so yeah that, that's kind of it good good you know just the sort of stuff you do at home you need to, i spend a lot of time outdoors whether it's teaching courses doing my own trips doing trips with clients and you just you know if i didn't brush my teeth properly every day and all of those things you you should do at home i'd, I'd have no teeth um so you have to maintain those normal routines um and get all of that done before the day starts before you start doing whatever you're doing before your journey starts before your teaching starts before your course starts whatever it is that you're doing um, and then get it out of the way and then as I say um, end of the day you asked about clothes as well um, it depends sometimes they need drying out and hanging up and airing off other times they need um, they don't need that I, I tend to use the, the, the warmer layers for, for a pillow they might go into a dry bag to, to keep them together for a pillow um, sometimes I'll wear a t-shirt I'll, I'll normally have a sleeping bag liner although in really cold conditions I don't because um, I'll be wearing merino wool underwear long johns um, and, a, and a top so I don't tend to and also just the extra faff of a sleeping bag liner and really if you're bivvying out in really cold conditions it does add a bit of warmth but I'd rather just have the merino and have the simplicity of getting in and out efficiently rather than messing around I'm talking like bivvying out at minus 30 celsius um, but generally, if it's warmer than that, I, I may well be using a sleeping bag liner, in which case I don't mind if I'm sleeping naked, if I'm sleeping just in underpants, because you, you've got a, a layer between you. If I'm not using a sleeping bag liner, I like to have at least a t-shirt on, so I'm not making my sleeping bag too greasy too quickly um, from, from oils on the body. If it's colder and unexpectedly I've always got a thin merino base layer with me so I might be wearing that just for extra warmth. Um, it, it depends what, what I'm wearing in bed. Putting a hat on to keep warm. We've got a lot of stuff on these tips and tricks of having a comfortable night out on the Frontier Bushcraft. We did a team blog on that a little while ago by the way so have a look on the Frontier Bushcraft blog. Frontierbushcraft.com forward slash blog. Um, some good stuff on there from the Frontier Bushcraft team myself included. 
um, which is separate to my personal blog, paulkirtley.co.uk. Sleeping bag. Generally, I will hang it up. Again, like the socks, while it's still warm in the morning, that's when it's going to have most uh, impetus to, to evaporate moisture off. Hang it up. Um, I tend not, unless it's an absolutely clear blue sky, a bit of a breeze coming through, no sign of any rain, and I'm not going to be far away, I don't hang my sleeping bag up outside. I'll always hang it up underneath my tarp because um, then I can not have to remember to put it in if it starts raining. And I know you should, you probably should, but the number of times I've seen students and colleagues um, come a cropper with that where there's been a, a, some spits of rain, they've not thought about it until later and their sleeping bag's got damp um, because they left it hanging out. Hang it, that hanging line that you hang your socks on overnight and other bits and pieces, hang your sleeping bag underneath it during the day. Breeze blowing underneath um, will take uh, a lot of the moisture away and uh, that's generally what I do. Um, I think that's as much as I've got time for now Mikey but and, and those are things that I pretty much always try and do um, wherever I am. Foot hygiene, you know personal hygiene, um, having a good breakfast, making sure the fire stuff is ready the night before, airing the sleeping bag out in the morning, um, that's all regular stuff. It's cooling off here and it's getting darker. Next question. Compass bubbles. This is from Andrew. His question is, hi, many, pan many, panks, many thanks for your informative sessions. In episode 59 of Ask Paul Kirtley, you answered a question about sorting, sorry, uh, I apologise, about storing compasses and mentioned bubbles. I have had a silver compass for a number of years and recently a bubble about a quarter of an inch wide, that, that's quite big actually, um, formed in it. Um, is this a problem and is there anything I can do to get rid of it? Also, if the compass needs replacing, how can I avoid the same thing happening again? Um, I really enjoy your videos and benefit from them. Keep up the good work. Regards, Andrew Buchanan. Um, well, Andrew, yeah, the, the, the main issue with bubbles in the liquid in compasses is that um, the surface tension of the bubble can basically hold the the compass needle at an angle that it wouldn't otherwise be sitting at if it was allowed to move freely. Um, that's, that surface tension effect is what allows pond skaters, say, to, to skate around on, a, on the top of a pond. There's, uh, the, the surface of a liquid has a, has a surface tension um, that means that it's a little bit harder to penetrate. It also means that things stick to it. Why droplets of water stick to things? Um, and so it's going to hold you potentially hold your compass needle offline a little bit. So yes, it can be an issue. Um, that sounds like quite a large bubble. That means the air has got into it somehow, um, which means it's not sealed. That may have happened due to a change in pressure. That could be air pressure, um, just uh, atmospheric air pressure but then it would have to have had a, a crack or something, or it could be more forced pressure if you've traveled on, a, on an aeroplane or something. Um, so it could be any of those things. It's hard to know how to prevent that exactly. As I've said, try, if you're traveling, try to take your compass in the, the um, I always get that the wrong way around, in the cabin with you, not in the hold, um, because the pressure is more likely to be one more likely to be stable in the in the cabin i know a lot of holds are pressurized these days as well but some of them aren't um and it's always good to have that with you anyway you know the way that large bags are thrown around on luggage conveyors and airports on and off trucks and things you don't want your compass or your binoculars or other sensitive equipment in there anyway you want them in your uh, carry-on luggage with you in the cabin where you can look after them um, that that's that really um, if you haven't had the compass for very long maybe speak to silver about it you know silver are a good uh, manufacturer I don't know the details of their warranty off the top of my head but it might be worth if you think nothing has happened um, untowards to it to it it's unexplained it could be that the, it's not sealed properly and I would 
potentially have a chat with the manufacturer about it if you haven't had it for very long that's what i would do um in terms of preventing it again as i say the main thing is those changes in pressure particularly for travel on planes um it's unlikely you know with most compasses it's unlikely to hap just happen um and therefore uh, unless somehow it becomes unsealed and there and, that, and that's not likely to happen and therefore i wouldn't worry about it too much it's probably an isolated relatively isolated incident to get that amount of air in for no real reason um without knowing more of the specifics i can't give you a more specific answer to that um but hopefully that's helpful i'd have a chat with um silver about it right fire saw with bamboo this is instagram this is from andrew casey nice photo of a bit of bamboo there his question is hi paul kirtley um i hope this finds you well in the full swing of the course season so this was from a little while ago um i found some bamboo in my shed which has got me thinking could you explain the fire saw method of fire by friction please thank you um right okay um the piece that you have there okay so you need to take a section of that maybe about 12 to 18 inches long and you split it down the middle so you've got a semicircular piece and then in the middle of that length you need to cut a notch in um not very wide maybe centimeter width at most at the top and then coming down to a very narrow aperture at the bottom um, so it's just gone through um, it doesn't have to but you can do it just so the, just so the notch just penetrates and through like a v notch on so you've got your like piece of like upturned guttering if you like and then you cut a v notch in it that way so that the, the notch goes across the guttering's that way the curvature of it is that way the notch is there and then what you need to do is take another piece and find a sharp edge on it and you might need to you might need to, to change that a little bit and then what you're going to be doing is rubbing your piece of guttering up and down the sharp edge if you like to create the friction and you can keep that bit with a sharp edge quite long if you want so you can hold it stabilize it hold it between your knees perhaps against your so halt stand hold it between your knees up against and then you can rub on the on the lower part perhaps or find some other position that, that works depending on the length that you've got left um, and then what you need to do is put some tinder material like the sort of thing that you would blow a hand drill or a bow drill um, ember to flame with in behind that notch that you've created um, now you can hold that with your hand although some people use um, another thin strip of material that's um, wedged between the inner um, cavity separators that you get in in um, in bamboo you can put a piece across a bit, under a bit of tension and that will hold down some of that tinder that sits behind the notch and then you basically you're rubbing that on the edge of, of that sharp piece and um, you get it get it to the heat where your um tinder is started to to ignite um you need you don't want stuff like bracken you want stuff that's relatively dense you could try working with some fluffy seed down um with you know things like kapok work well um i've not tried um cattails for example because you don't tend to get cattails and bamboo together at least not in places i've been um fibrous materials coconut husk that type of stuff in behind it have an experiment with those have an experiment with those um, materials um also i seem to recall seeing quite i've never made a video on it um I seem to recall seeing quite a good video by an ex US survival instructor I think he was on YouTube somewhere who had I think he'd served in the or taught in the Philippines or somewhere in Southeast Asia and it was quite a good quick demonstration of the technique um, the way that you the way that you work it to get it to work maybe have a look on YouTube for that but you've certainly got enough in the right um in the right consistency there to have a good go at it right i'm getting a little bit cold it's getting a little bit dark last question this is from twitter this is from chris reeves 
and his question is hi pkurt which is my twitter handle came across a black ant's nest under a slab of slate there were a good few handfuls of lava are they edible yes is the quick answer um the classic thing to do in the woods um, with ant lava is to find a wood ant's nest because they're big and they're easily accessible lay down a tarp or a jacket um, put some sticks around the edges fold the edges over so there's like little areas of shadow around the edge and then what you do is the ant's nest which you put this tarp down next to is you delve into it and you've got to do this quickly because the ants will try and, um, and bite you and um, with their pincers and insert some uh, formic acid which stings <laughs> um, grab handfuls of this inner part of the ant's nest which is the stable temperature part of the ant's nest where the larvae are going to be grab the contents and just chuck it onto this tarp and it sounds quite destructive um, it would be if you did it every week but if you do it once and every now and again I mean and remember ants, wood ants nest gets raided by badgers they get raided by um, ground feeding woodpeckers like green woodpeckers um, various creatures go in there for food anyway um, so we're no different in that respect go in there get the materials chuck it onto the tarp and then what the ants do is they take the larva out of the sun out of the direct sunlight into the shadow around the edges and so they're separating out the larvae for, for 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 you from all of the other detritus the uh, pine needles and bits of uh, wood chip and what have you that's um, and the earthy material that's in the middle of that and they'll separate and then you can collect them up and yeah you can eat them raw if you want to you can slightly just lightly fry them off in the bottom of a metal mug um, with a little bit of oil um and they're kind of a little bit like shrimps they're a little, kind of that kind of co consistency um and the wood ants are a little bit bigger so the larva are a little bit bigger and then take the materials and the the ants and, and and what's left on your tarp and and put that back into what you've dug out and leave it as as well as you can and uh, and that's it so yes they are edible um, some people really like them ants are edible as well some people like to pick an ant up and and bite the abdomen off um and it is has quite a lemony tang again because of the acid in there it's got that sharpness to it um i think it's a bit cruel <laughs> but i guess eating the lava is a bit cruel as well um and i have known of people get an ant pinched onto their tongue as well if they do it wrong so that's always at least the ant gets the chance to get its own back that way but that's it that is the end of this episode which was Episode 63 of Aspore Kirtley. Thank you. Good night.